Hello to everyone. Uh, really glad that you could all join. And um, our topic today is Can We Repatriate the ISIS Children? And this is our third in a series of uh, Zoom meetings. We started them during COVID-19, and uh, we've been really pleased that we can bring people from all over the world. Usually our events are um, in person with some pretty nice lunches or dinners, but they're just local. And today, our, as I said, our topic is, can we repatriate the ISIS children? And we're gonna hear from two really great speakers who've been involved in repatriations of children born or brought into ISIS by their parents. In these cases, it will be about bringing them home to the US, Germany, and Sweden. Then in two weeks, on July 8th, we're going to return to the topic of rehabilitating ISIS terrorists and those incarcerated on terrorism charges. And we'll hear from uh, our Dutch colleagues, uh, Yola Wanders. She's former head of the Supermax Terrace Prison in the Netherlands, and Gabby Thyssen. And they'll both present on the Dutch model. And they promise to tell us what works, why it works, and when nothing works. So, um, you know, some admission that sometimes you cannot get through to these people. And we'll keep going with the online events as long as we're locked up with COVID. And, uh, we're really happy to try to share as much information as we can. Today we have uh, 300 participants that have registered, although some of them are in places like Indonesia, Australia, and when they heard we were recording said maybe I'll just watch the recording because it's in the middle of the night for them. But like I said, people are from all over the world, which is really cool. And you can uh, join on chat. You can ask questions uh, throughout and what we're doing is we're capturing the chat and then the questions that we're able to answer we answer and we post it with the YouTube video later on our website and we'll try to unmike people and let them ask their questions themselves, although that is a bit of a challenge when the group gets big. And I want to thank Zach Vadorf. He's our video director and he makes most of our videos along with uh, Sheikh Ali. And uh, Zach is uh, doing our um, technical things today, and Molly Allenberg and Claire Wooster are helping on other issues. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, Past and Present, U.S. State Department, the European Union, uh, UN Women, Facebook, private donors, and the state of Qatar. And for those of you that don't know us, uh, we make counter-narrative videos based on ISIS interviews and Al-Shabaab interviews. And we've made 240 interviews at this point. I'm going to let Molly post in chat uh, where you can see our counter narrative videos. They're all posted up on YouTube. And uh, Molly is responsible now for running our uh, Facebook campaigns with those videos. So we try to use the words of ISIS insiders to denounce the group and to use that for intervention and prevention. But I can't talk much on that today because I don't want to use the time. Ah, as far as uh, my involvement in today's topic, I don't consider myself an activist. I'm a researcher and an academic, but on this topic, I think I did uh, fall into activism, probably as our other speakers would also admit. And I haven't personally brought any children home yet, although I volunteered to do so. I've, I've uh, told many state authorities, if you're too afraid to send your own people, give me the passport of the child. Uh, arrange the transport and I will do it because I'm not too afraid to do that. And um, I have been involved in a number of cases. The first for me was the case of Samantha El Hassani. She's an American ISIS wife. She had two pass US passport holding children that were born in the US. And one was a young boy that had been forced to appear in an ISIS video threatening the US and two were born in Raqqa. Others also worked on this case. I was brought in by the Canadians and Alexandria Bain from Canada also worked on it. And my involvement was on the American side. So I immediately contacted Ambassador Doug Silliman, who was um, serving in Baghdad as our ambassador and congressman from the state she came from. And when I did so, I was amazed that State Department's stance on the case was to uh, handle it a lot like we do child custody disputes. And they protected Samantha's right to make her decisions for her children, including keeping them in Camp Roche with her. Samantha was telling her sister she wanted to send the two youngest and sickliest children home and the two oldest she wanted to keep with her. And when I raised it to State Department and asked them, you know, how can these kids be sitting in a camp and not being rescued for months? I think it was nine months that they were in Camp Roche. 
the State Department's answer was that she's got the right to do what she wants with her children, um, that uh, we don't even know if the children are hers, especially the two that were born in Raqqa. They don't have documents. How do we ID them? Um, how do we take children, in the case of the two oldest ones, from a mother who doesn't want to give them up? And we can't risk personnel to go and get them. And my answer to that was very simple. When journalist James Foley was taken captive by ISIS, uh, we sent the Navy SEALs in. They weren't successful, sadly, uh, but at least we tried. And we have to say of Foley that he was an adult man who willingly put himself in a conflict zone. And what happened to him should have never happened. And we did try to rescue him. But when we compare that to the children, and these are two passport holding American children, they didn't have any choice in the matter. They were taken to ISIS by their parents. They didn't choose, neither are they guilty of any crimes. The one boy was forced into an ISIS film, but he's a little boy. And um, so I asked, where are the Navy SEALs? Um, do we only rescue journalists and we don't rescue children? But one of the answers was that she's got a right to do with what she wants with her children. I also asked, um, these children aren't in the custody of ISIS anymore. They're in the custody of our American allies, the SDF, that's Syrian Democratic Forces, who wanted to send them home. And so our soldiers were driving by the camp that they were in on a daily basis. At that point, we had 10 bases um, in Syria. And, um, why couldn't our soldiers facilitate the movement of genetic testing and the personnel to facilitate their movement and guard those personnel if State Department was willing to send people? And uh, we argued back and forth for a long time. And uh, finally, our Justice Department became involved. And they agreed with me because I said, a mother that takes her children into ISIS if she had been at home, if she had been in any state at home, if she had been arrested going to the airport with her children, um, she would have been separated from her children. Even if she was sitting her children in front of ISIS YouTube videos, probably a judge would have temporarily suspended her custody of her own children. So I argued that the federal government should follow this same legal stance, but we don't have any statutes or any precedent of that type. And uh, State Department was kind of like, boy, we've never done that before. And uh, justice supported me on that point of view. But it just stayed uh, stuck. And I went around uh, speaking about it and spoke at the OSCE. And I am not sure if there were many people involved, what finally pushed it. But Samantha herself was brought home with all four children. And that's always an argument. If we bring the kids home, do we have to bring the mothers home? Or the fathers, for that matter. Um, there were also concerns with the family members about the oldest boy that had uh, appeared in this video. I think he was 10 at the time he was repatriated, 10 or 11. And uh, some of the family members were worried that he actually was a terrorist. Some were worried that he would never be accepted back in his home community and that keeping him in Syria with his mother was the best thing, which was really tragic. Uh, so those kids finally got home. Then, as I continued to travel in Iraq and in Syria, I met other mothers of young children and I got involved in some of their cases. Uh, Shamima Begum's case, like I told you in our first session, for those who were uh, taking part in it. Um, before her child was born, I wrote to the UK authorities and said, Camp Rouge is not a place for a baby. Um, this baby's not going to make it. And you should send people. Uh, Jack Straw said he wouldn't risk any personnel. And my answer always was, give me the documents. I will hold this baby and bring this baby home. Mothers told me, my child has asthma. My child is um, uh, passing out from asthma, turns blue, stops breathing. Please, I want my child sent home. Even if you can't take me home, please help me to get my child home. So this turned me into a bit of an activist. And I started uh, contacting different capitals and saying, do you know you've got seven Belgian children that you know, two of them are seriously ill and uh, could die there. And in fact, 351 children uh, died in the camps in the last year. Um, let's see. So right now we know that there's, uh, according to the UN, that there's 8,000 children of foreign, foreign terrorist fighters and 700 to 750 of the children are believed to be European. Um, there's issues on parentage because many ISIS mothers had multiple husbands and sometimes the children 
uh, can claim European heritage from their their fathers, not their mothers, but their fathers are dead. So what do we do with that? Or their parents have had their citizenship, citizenship stripped, as in the case of Shamima Begum. So then what does that mean for her child? Does her child uh, not have a right to citizenship? There's also 20,000 Iraqi children, although I'm not sure that that is uh, current. And Iraq says they've repatriated over 800 children. Some countries have uh, begun repatriating, uh, France took home, I think it was 12 in the last week, but it's really piecemeal. They're brought on a case-by-case -case manner. It's not systematic. Um, they tend to favor the orphans because they don't want to be in these thorny issues of separating mothers from children or somehow opening the door that the mothers can at some point get home. Um, as I told you, there's issues about IDing them. Uh, ISIS uh, made birth certificates and the UN is saying, please take those seriously and the issue the kids' documents based on those. Um, the UN is also urging countries um, to take the mothers back as well, saying it's not in the best interest to separate mothers from children. The um, SDF uh, pretty much feels the same way but they are willing to send children home without their mothers um, in case by cases. Um, so as I told you, 371 children died in SDF camps in 2019. And I could go on and on about these camps. There's ISIS enforcers there. There's um, uh, uh, ISIS women that uh, set the, the tents on fire of other women that have walked away from ISIS. Um, they're, they're murderers and horrible people, and the children have done no crimes and are subjected to this on a daily basis. It's cold in the winter. Um, uh, Hoda Mathana told me that she didn't have a heater for her child. Her child has chronic bronchitis. Can you imagine being in wintertime with no heater and your child uh, has, uh, his lungs are filling with fluid? It's horrible. Medical care is uh, difficult to access. So um, I'm going to stop there, but um, I asked our video editor to take a couple of the cases of the children and make a very short video so that we could be absolutely sure who we're talking about. We didn't blur their faces for um, this presentation, so um, please don't record it, and it will be on the website, but we'll blur their faces. So just this is just very short, one minute. Tu veux rentrer en Belgique? Tu veux aller en Belgique? Oui, tu veux aller en Belgique? Oui? Oh bon, c'est vrai ça? D'accord, on va essayer. Allez, tu dis bonjour à toute la Belgique? Dis bonjour pour la Belgique. Bonjour. À qui? Bonjour. Bonjour. La Belgique? Bonjour la Belgique. Bra bravo, bravo. Est-ce que tu es entrée? Est-ce que votre fils est dans? Non! <rire> Tell me, are you a terrorist? Are you a terrorist? I don't think so. Do you want to go home and see your grandma and your grandpa and your auntie? So I just wanted you to see that so you know what we're talking about. I mean, some of these are really small children and uh, I did make a habit of for a while asking the mothers, is this child a terrorist? Uh, just because I wanted it on film. And, uh, you know, come on. So our next speaker is Ambassador Peter Galbraith. And as he was uh, joking with our Croatian uh, colleague who's here, uh, he, was, uh, he served as US Ambassador to Croatia uh, some years back and uh, still longs to go back there because it's a beautiful place. And uh, he has been the Deputy Special Representative of the Secretary General of the UN to Afghanistan in 2009. Uh, he was a cabinet member at East Timor's uh, transitional government in 2000 and 2001. He's the author of two critically acclaimed books on the Iraq war. And since 2013, Ambassador Galbraith has uh, engaged in uh, mediation projects uh, with the Syrian opposition and the Syrian Kurds. He's traveled 15 times to Northeast Syria since 2014, and he was there in November 2019, just after Turkey invaded, which was a very dangerous time. And at the request of the Syrian Kurdish administration, he's been working to find a solution for the 10,000 foreign ISIS women and ch children currently detained in Northeast Syria. Uh, in November 2019, he rescued three German children and one American child who 
who had been in the ISIS camps, and I'm going to let him tell that story. And after Ambassador Galbraith, we'll hear from Beatrice Erickson. And uh, uh, Ambassador Galbraith has a much longer bio. We'll put it on the website and you can read it, but I don't want to take all the time uh, going into all the details. So it's over to you. Oh, Anne, uh, thank you very much, and, and thank you for the work you're doing, and thank you for uh, highlighting this, uh, this very important issue. Um, uh, and greetings to all from uh, rural Vermont. Uh, I, I think I should start by uh, explaining a little bit about uh, how I got involved in this. Um, I've had a long association with, with the Kurds. It goes back to the 1980s when I was on the staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and sort of stumbled across in northern Iraq the beginning of the uh, onfall, the Kurdish genocide. Uh, and uh, so sort of from that, uh, I developed a relationship with the Iraqi Kurds and, uh, and with, with some of the small community people who were concerned, notably Bernard Kushner, the former French foreign minister who was the founder of Doctors Without Borders. Uh, and then in 2013, um, I began working with a British uh, charity on a, on a mediation effort, both among the Kurdish uh, factions and in, in parties in Northeast Syria. And then in the 2015, the President Hollande of France asked Bernard Kushner and myself to try to mediate between the um, Iraqi Kurd, the KRG and the, um, and, and the authorities in Northeast Syria. You know, there's an expression, the Kurds have no friends but the mountains. I always amend it, but they have many enemies and the worst are the Kurds. Uh, and um, anyhow, I can't say that we made tremendous progress. At one point we did get the, the border open. But as a result of that, they asked Bernard Kushner and myself back about 18 months ago for help in figuring out what to do with all these people that were, that were coming into their hands. Uh, this was before the fall of, of Barguz. Uh, and, and what is it that they should do about it? Um, I have to say Bernard and I did not entirely agree. Uh, so I'm gonna offer my view. I, I came I came to the view, and I still have the view, uh, that um, it doesn't do any good to say that governments, uh, particularly Western governments, but we have to remember a lot of these people are from non-Western countries as well, the South Asia, North Africa. It doesn't do any good to say that governments should take back their people when they won't. And when actually they have perfectly good reasons not to take back their people. Uh, in any normal situation, uh, if you've committed a crime in the country, you're tried in the country where you committed the crime. Uh, you know, it, it, you, you don't go to a British court to be tried for a criminal act uh, you committed in uh, New York. So it's done in a, a New York court. Uh, and there are, there are enormous evidentiary issues that with, with trying to do the trials uh, outside of uh, Syria for crimes committed in Syria. And beyond that, um, you know, they, they worry that uh, while maybe most people would come back and not commit a further terrorist act, uh, even one a further terrorist act is going to be very bad politically. I mean, imagine you're the President Macron of France. Uh, how do you weigh uh, the fear of another Bataclan theater attack against uh, the return of people who, after all, all chose uh, to go to uh, Northeast Syria. So I, as a result of, 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 you know, that's the mentality we can, we can debate whether it's right or wrong. I think it's understandable. But the important point is that to simply say they should do something they're not going to do is to not solve the problem. And if you don't solve the problem, it means that these children, uh, the women and children, everybody's going to remain in Northeast Syria indefinitely. And what happens to the children if they remain there indefinitely? Um, and as Anne points out, they're, they're, of course, the people who have no, you know, who, who are not responsible for anything. But if they remain indefinitely, they, they grow up in these uh, uh, camps uh, uh, where the conditions are very difficult, not due to ill will by the Syrian Kurds, but to a lack of resources and the, I must say, rather shameful failure of the international community, which spent billions combating ISIS and is not putting up the 
you know, few millions that might, might better uh, uh, contain and, and uh, handle this, this uh, very large population. But anyhow, the, the children uh, grow up in these camps with uh, no schooling, uh, with uh, very minimal uh, health care, um, and uh, in places that, uh, particularly Al Hol, that are controlled by radical women. So, you know, it, it inevitably you also have to worry that you're just going to be raising the next generation of uh, suicide bombers, uh, murderers, and rapists. So, um, uh, it seemed to me, uh, both on for a broader uh, societal purpose, uh, and but also what's in the best interest of the child. It's clearly not in the best interest of the child to grow up without education or to grow up in an environment where they're going to be trained to be a suicide bomber or murderer, um, that the children are removed from the camps. Um, and so I, I've been talking to various people uh, about the idea of uh, moving the children out of the camps, maybe having a system of, fo a system of foster care, which would be internationally financed um, uh, 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 for the younger children and, and something like the SOS children's villages for the older children. Uh, now, this has been resisted by human rights groups um, on the grounds and, and by the UN on the grounds that you don't uh, take children from their mothers. Uh, and, you know, again, I, that's understandable position, but you have to, that isn't the world we're operating in. And, and so just to say that when you know that governments aren't going to take back their people is not, not, a, not a, a solution. And the Kurds are unwilling to remove children from the camps because uh, they don't want to be criticized by um, human rights groups or the UN. And they also know that if they remove the children from the camps, they are going to make the issue of governing the camps with the, uh, where the women are without the children much more difficult. And so they would need resources to make them the, cam the camps more secure. Uh, in any event, this was my view and, and my recommendation. And in the course of discussing it, uh, I encountered a, um, uh, a journalist for The Guardian uh, named Martin Chuloff. And he said, but you know, there's a woman in the camp who wants to send her children out. Uh, and uh, so he gave, in Al Hall, he, he gave me uh, her, her name and he said her most valuable possession is a, a, a phone, uh, which she buries at night to protect it. Uh, and so, uh, and I'm gonna change some of the details about this woman just to protect her privacy. Um, but uh, so when I went next time to Al Hall, I went into the camp administration and I asked to see Elsa. Uh, and uh, they said, oh, well, do you have a, a number for her? Oh, yeah, I do. And I picked up the phone and called her. Of course, uh, when I went to the room to meet her, they had seized her phone and she was in complete tears, understandably. Um, but I also knew that she was, you know, there was something different about her. Um, uh, she, uh, for one thing, she, she had three children. She had brought her daughter, which whom she was still nursing and nursing in front of me, um, which I don't think was exactly uh, ISIS approved behavior uh, with a strange man. Uh, and she told her story. Uh, she uh, uh, grew up in a, uh, her parents were not, were not married, uh, although they were a, a couple in Germany. Maybe they were a bit free spirits. And at some point she decided that she, uh, uh, wanted to become a, uh, a, a Christian and a devout Christian. And then she began to think, well, this Trinity stuff doesn't quite make sense. Uh, and possibly was a little skeptical about the resurrection and in the manner of seeking as a young person, um, she uh, uh, discovered Islam and uh, uh, eventually married a uh, man online. Uh, that she had met met online and and well he came to germany and and they also met up in in person he was a a person of uh of um of, of, of from an african country uh, uh but uh, uh whose family was li living in uh in in uh, britain uh in any event um uh she uh uh uh, her her husband, uh, they were in Egypt and he ran into trouble after Morsi was overthrown and was in prison and tortured and uh, she went back to Germany. But by this point, they had two kids. Um, 
And then uh, he went to Syria and kept trying to persuade her to come. Uh, and uh, she would talk to him. She was a bit suspicious. Uh, he insisted that uh, you know, she was the only one in his life, but he, he, she suspected maybe there was somebody else. But eventually she did come with the two boys and uh, um, uh, discovered there was another wife uh, who was actually an American. Uh, I asked her, uh, well, how did that work out? And she said, well, it was three days with her, three days with me, and a lot of fights and tears. And I said, well, so what did your husband do? He said, oh, well, he got a third wife. Um, but uh, in any event, uh, she also recounted the story of uh, how um, uh, uh, they were f fleeing and, and uh, her husband uh, uh, she was, was killed, and in fact, in front of the eyes of the, of the two boys, um, and uh, uh, by a drone strike. Uh, and eventually she escaped. A in any event, uh, I contacted the, uh, I had some friends in the German uh, foreign ministry and said, she wants to sit, bring her children out. Um, she's not coming. Uh, and, uh, and the grandparents will, will take the children. Uh, and I said, you, you know, you, and, and I'll get them to the border. Uh, they, they had, the Germans had previously taken orphans uh, but they were, you know, they hadn't been well, they hadn't been willing to take other people, or to be more precise, send diplomats in to recover other people, and and so they they agreed, um, and uh, then uh, I think they, you know, it's it's one of those things that we tend to view people who work in government as part of a big machine, and I suppose they are, but they aren't all cogs, and I think that's really an important point. Um, uh, so. Uh, uh, in, in talking to one of the, uh, my regular contact in the German foreign ministry about this, uh, I, I think she and maybe her colleagues were moved on a human level by this woman who had really was willing to send her children out in order to save them, a bit like uh, the judgment of Solomon, I felt. And so at the last minute, they said, well, we don't, we, we don't mind if you also bring the mother. And so when I saw the mother at the border, uh, with her kids, uh, uh, she um, she was also in tears, but because of the realization that she was uh, going to get out. Um, the uh, interesting thing is that the um, her and I, I, I her stepdaughter, and I'm not sure is it a stepdaughter if if uh, it's it's the daughter of a concurrent wife as opposed to a, a consecutive wife. But anyhow, uh, her her stepdaughter was a uh, her her co-wife had had a, a three-year-old daughter, uh, who, and therefore who was an American. And I spoke to the, um, uh, the friend who worked in the uh, Trump administration, a political appointee. Um, uh, and I, I have to say, although I approached the administration uh, without any uh, great admiration, no, no admiration at all, um, uh, but uh, nonetheless, this person jumped on the case of this uh, little American girl and uh, eventually they did the DNA testing. And at the very last minute, the test came back positive. And, and uh, so we had to wait hours at the border while the Kurds brought the child, this child from Al Hall. Uh, uh, the, the, the German police were on the other side of the border. They did, and they did um, you know, some fairly extensive interrogations. Uh, I must say they were very, very nice people. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the Germans went to uh, Erbil, sp stayed overnight, flew to uh, Frankfurt the next day. Uh, Elsa uh, is with her parents. Um, she sent it's pictures of her children doing just normal things. They're in the normal schools. I think one of them's in a Montessori school. They, you know, they're going to the Christmas market, yeah, Easter egg hunts. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a story with a, a nice ending. I don't know. I, in fact, I'm sure it's not really uh, very, very typical. Um, she still has a case, two cases against her. Uh, one is um, uh, uh, for support for terrorism. Uh, I'm not sure that that's all that strong a case. And the, uh, uh, and the other case is endangering her children, uh, her two sons, by bringing them to Syria. I've told her that <laughs> there's, that's not a case for which you have a defense. 
But uh, I think the, the view of the German government is, um, and I'm hoping this is the view, is that this really is a good mother. The kids are well adjusted. And no purpose would be served by you know, any form of imprisonment. She, she was not detained when she went back to Germany. Uh, and, and I just have to say something about uh, you know, the people who handled this in Germany. I mean, the, the, the government officials, the police, the people in the Ausfahrtskos Amt, you know, they, they were really, I, I think, just very humane. And perhaps uh, this solidifies uh, the, my view that uh, Germany is the moral leader of the free world at this point in time. Thank you, Peter. Uh, and uh, I've had the same experience working with the Germans. We've done 21 cases that we've gone over with the detainees, uh, full permission to share their cases, what they said, and to uh, let the Germans view their videos. And uh, they've been amazing how they're working. And uh, they want to do the just thing, which includes prosecution. But uh, you know, they do stay of sentences as well. Um, when we I, get I guess to I'll just add, add to this. Um, yeah, uh, they and they are prosecuting a, a woman now um, who uh, for having a Yazidi slave. And there is another German woman in the camps uh, that I learned about. Um, who uh, she she was a, a ethnic German, uh, and she had a, she had two two of her own children, and uh, and then this little boy who didn't look anything like her, uh, and uh, so I was able to contact the uh, the Kurdish authorities about this, and indeed it was a Yazidi child, a four year old boy that she had been abusing. So they they've arrested her, uh, and uh, and the boy is now in an orphanage. Uh, uh, with other children, I, I can't quite call them children, Yazidi children, because the Yazidis refuse to recognize them. But there is a, a separate orphanage in, in Northeast Syria that now has 51 children of raped uh, Yazidi women uh, the, 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 who were used as the sex slaves. Uh, and, and I think it's important as we focus on the children of ISIS that we also remember those children. Um, uh, it turns out that some, the, the, what, what had happened, for, I mean, I think many of you are familiar with the story, but, but just for those who aren't, um, the Yazidi uh, religion has survived uh, under you know, centuries of uh, persecution, like other minority religions in the Middle East, by uh, not doing any conversion, not allowing um, marriage or, or, or sexual relations outside the faith. So it was actually a big step for them to say that the raped women could come back. And initially the, the Yazidi Pope, as it were, said the children could come back too, but there was such an outcry that he said, no, I misspoke, the, the, uh, the, the children can't. Um, it, it turns out uh, that some number of the mothers would like to have their children back. And, and I think that's something that we, uh, you know, needs to be worked on as well. And, but if they do, they're, you know, you, it's not going to be possible for them to have their children and remain in either Iraq or Syria with the Yazidi community. So this is going to have to require third country resettlement. Um, but it's really a small number of people and, and really sad stories. Um, and all these children are small right? because the rapes began in 2014. So the earliest the, any child was born was about now in 2015. Uh, so the oldest is five. The Kurds are taking good care of them, but you know, they can they have very limited resources. If I can make a if I can make a no, comment. No, not yet, not yet. Sorry. Okay. Um, D just a legal aspect. I, I'd like Beatrice to be able to speak and then we'll open it. Okay. Um, so thank you, Peter, for speaking. And I'm sorry for saying we're gonna wait for questions, but I want to make sure each speaker gets their time. So next, uh, and I have a zillion questions I want to ask Ambassador Galbraith myself, so I'm sure it's hard to wait. But uh, our next speaker is Beatrice Eriksson from Sweden. She's a social worker, and she just recently co-founded and is the chair, I want to say chairwoman, Beatrice, hope that's okay, of Repatriate the Children Sweden. And this NGO was founded in May of 2020, and a, as a response for the need of uh, one of the co-founders of this NGO, Patricio Galvez, who sought to save his seven orphaned grandchildren who were in Al Hol camp during the spring of 2019, orphans without either mother or father. 
Uh, Repatriate the Children appeals to Sweden to implement the Convention of the Rights of the Child. And I'm, I'm gonna let Beatrice talk about that rather than me talking about it. So the floor is yours, Beatrice, and then we will open it to questions and we'll um, let our first questioner ask uh, immediately. Okay? Thank Go you. ahead, Beatrice. Thank you, and thank you, Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Galbraith and Dr. Specker for sharing uh, some of your experience of your important work. Uh, my name is Beatrice Eriksson, and I was part of the repatriation process of seven children of ISIS supporting parents. And the only repatriation case of such regarding Swedish citizens so far, actually. Um, it was in April last year that I first met with Patricio Galvez in Erbil in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. I went there as a student to conduct interviews for my master thesis about victims of ISIS. And Patricio was there on a personal mission, uh, which was to rescue his seven orphaned grandchildren. So our paths crossed, uh, which resulted in a situation where um, I think we became part of something that has changed uh, our lives forever. But I, I wanna go back and start by providing some contextual understanding. Uh, from Sweden, uh, some 300 people traveled to Iraq and Syria to join ISIS or groups that came to align with ISIS. Uh, that means that per capita, Sweden is uh, one of the countries with the biggest population of foreign fighters supporting ISIS on the ground in the Middle East. Uh, some of these ISIS supporters and ISIS fighters brought their children from Sweden with them, and some of them got uh, children in the, in the so-called caliphate. Among these 300 Swedes, the most notorious uh, terrorist, I would say, was called Mikael Skruomo. Uh, he and his wife Amanda brought their four children at that time to Syria, uh, and during their time there, they had three more children. As both uh, Mikael and Amanda were killed uh, in the end battles in January and March last year, uh, their seven orphans between the age of one to eight years old uh, were left orphaned. Meanwhile, um, in Sweden, uh, their grandfather, uh, that is the father of Amanda, uh, he had for years desperately been trying to convince his daughter to return to Sweden with her children. Um, as he and Amanda's mother had separated some 20 years ago, uh, he had quite, never quite understood how his daughter, born and raised in Sweden to left his secular parents, um, had come to convert to Islam and later gotten radicalized. Um, he has described his daughter Amanda as a very empathetic person who always uh, was taking the side of their underdog. And Patricia himself, he had never had any interest in religion whatsoever. Uh, and uh, I would just rather describe him as a bohemian person, a musician, an artist that has never been close to any kind of violence or extremism. Um, during the years that his daughter um, uh, and her family um, uh, were living in, in the so-called caliphate, uh, Patricia felt very powerless and he couldn't get help from anywhere to find a resolution to this situation. Uh, when he, in January last year, got the news of the death of his daughter, that he, of course, never stopped loving, even though he knew what terrible atrocities ISIS uh, committed, he knew that since he couldn't save his daughter, how much he, he tried, um, at least he had to try to save he had to try all he could to save uh, his grandchildren. Um, so Patricio was pleading to the, to the, both to the Swedish and the, to the Chilean governments um, because uh, he himself was born in Chile. And he was begging for an urgent uh, humanitarian action um, because he knew that his grandchildren's lives were at stake uh, while the world was watching, but nothing happened. He got no response. Uh, he stood all alone in this and without having any other connection to the Middle Eastern region, not knowing the languages, uh, the context or having any social connections there. In April last year, he traveled to Northeast Syria to 
to search for his grandchildren. Quite uh, maybe naive <laughs> as he was, with no previous experience of traveling in a war-torn uh, war country, um, no quite knowledge of all the permits and other kind of obstacles that he would run into, he struggled hard and he kind of cried his way <laughs> step by step to, to reach to the point where he actually found his grandchildren. Um, the youngest one was found in a hospital as he was uh, very sick and the other one in the Alho camp. Um, at that time the youngest one was a year and a half but with a weight of less than less than three kilos. He was very bedridden and close to not making it. Patricio was devastated to realize that he would not be able to bring his grandchildren home with him unless the Swedish government officially would assure the autonomous administration um, their responsibility over these Swedish citizens. Um, and what Patricia heard was that all the, all the Kurds needed basically was a piece of paper with a stamp on it. So Patricio was appealing to the Swedish government to approve and to uh, confirm <laughs> to the autonomous administration of Northeast Syria that the children uh, were allowed to be released but he did not get any positive response. Uh, he was determined not to uh, return to Sweden without his grandchildren. And he got in contact with an old friend who is a documentary movie maker. His name is Gorki Glasser-Müller. And he asked him to fly to Northern Iraq to help him out. They set up a strategy uh, in network with some other friends and people that gladly would like to help. To, to advocate for the Swedish government to act uh, by exposing Patrizio and his grandchildren publicly, using media as a tool to put pressure on the decision makers back in Sweden. Even though public opinion has never been on the side of these um, children of ISIS parents, uh, Patrizio managed to create sentiment for his grandchildren's case. And I believe that anyone who have met Patricio or seen, seen him in the news or so can confirm that he has like a certain aura, like he's personalizing compassion and humanity. After a couple of months struggling in the Middle East, Patricio finally got the call from the Swedish authorities that he had been waiting for saying that we have brought your grandchildren out of Northeast Syria. They are now at the, here uh, at the consulate in Erbil. Please come and pick them up. He also found out that they wouldn't be able to travel back home to Sweden immediately, uh, but have to wait until the travel documents of the children were issued, which could take up to three weeks, he was told. Um, at this case, uh, at this age, uh, the case of uh, Patricia's grandchildren and his struggle had become almost a daily series in the media for the Swedish and international population to follow in real time. Uh, and also I follow this. Uh, after meeting with Patricio and Abel, uh, after he had found his grandchildren in Syria and waited for, for the Swedish government to, uh, to take action, uh, Patricio, Patricio and I stayed in contact um, and when I through media some, some weeks after I had met with Patricio in Erbil found out that his grandchildren had been released from the detention camp I got in contact again and I asked him if there was any help needed because but by that time I was back in Beirut in Lebanon where I was based at the time and I got the response if you can come then come so I booked a ticket and I went to Erbil the next day. I was lucky that there was a flight the next day because the flights are not um, on a daily basis between Beirut and Erbil. Um, after eight days, eight chaotic days, <laughs> stuck in a hotel room in Erbil uh, with high security, massive media coverage and a very, very pressured situation where the children, I mean, they had just been released from, from, from these camps that we heard um, uh, Dr. Speckhardt describe. Uh, and they had been coming up from a war zone. They were traumatized 
and they were malnourished. Um, they didn't have a rhythm of day and night when it came to sleeping. Uh, some of them uh, didn't want to eat. Uh, I think that a hotel room was just um, smelling so much uh, vomit and diarrhea and we did all we could and we got some help from local volunteers that helped out with the children, uh, which we we're so grateful for. Um, but after eight very, very intense days where I think uh, Patricio Gorky and myself didn't get many hours of sleep. Uh, I lost six kilos <laughs> because I didn't have the time to eat. We finally were allowed to travel with the children back home to Gothenburg, Sweden. During the year that has passed since we flew to Sweden with these seven children, uh, Patricio Gorky and myself have spent a huge amount of time being involved in the issue in different ways since the fact is that no other Swedish children have been uh, repatriated since. And we heard uh, that there are thousands uh, of children there, um, children from maybe more than 60 different countries. And some 50, maybe even up to 70 of these children are Swedish citizens. Um, and up until this day, uh, they are still uh, stranded, remaining in the camps or in prisons or lost elsewhere. Um, we are suffering deeply with all the children who are still remaining in the camps uh, or displaced elsewhere in Syria. We are suffering with their relatives um, that are still in the same situation that Patricio was uh, in last year and that are longing to be re reunited with, with their uh, grandchildren. Uh, Still, there are thousands of Yazidis missing and many children of Yazidi victims to be reunited with their families. Um, so that is why we decided to uh, form an organization advocating for Sweden to act. Um, because for us, we cannot accept that uh, the world is ignoring this massive uh, humanitarian crisis. And as we are wondering, why did Sweden bring seven home and not all of them? Uh, what is the problem? <laughs> why are the other kids still remaining there? Uh, there are a few arguments that are being repeatedly used by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, I mean, internationally, but all including the Swedish government as arguments not to repatriate. These reasons are, for example, that it's too dangerous, um, there are no diplomatic relations with the autonomous administration of Northeast Syria, um, there are uh, uh, difficulties identifying these detainees, the Kurds will not release the detainees, etc, etc, etc. So one thing we have done the past year is to monitor the situation and uh, what is being publicly stated in this issue and compare it with information we got uh, we get from people that have insight uh, in, in these processes. And it seems to us as all these arguments not to repatriate are pure nonsense. As we see it, there are no justification not to act in this issue. Um, the children of uh, ISIS parents are a highly vulnerable group in need of urgent assistance due to their location uh, in maybe the world's most dangerous uh, refugee camps in a war-torn region. Uh, I mean, the, the urgency of this question on of how to manage these cases cannot be overstated. And um, we agree with the Center for uh, for Global Policy, who recently published a new report claiming that left undealt with the challenges these children present uh, runs a serious risk of developing uh, from an easily solved welfare issue into a potential security and counterterrorism issue. So it would be in the interest of these some 60 countries with detained citizens in Northeast Syria, uh, not in a in a short, uh, short and long-term uh, interest to take action on the children left behind. Uh, and this is also a question of rule of law. Uh, under international law, children are the responsibility of uh, their home countries, which needs to address their future welfare and their uh, rehabilitation prospects. Uh, and also ethically, uh, we believe that 
children should not suffer imprisonment for crimes they have not committed. Um, as, as Dr. Specker just said, the vast majority of these children are below the age of 12, and many of them below the age of five. Uh, and um, we can only deduce the reasons of why these children still remain stranded in Northeastern Syria to that there are, there's no political will really to bring them home. Uh, and to be honest, public opinion has never been on these children's side. And uh, the outside world has chosen to brand them as ISIS children, which is probably the biggest stigma there could be. Um, and we have been advocating for one year now that uh, all Swedish children should be brought back home without any further delay. And that Sweden's actions need to be aimed at reducing human suffering on a direct level by rescuing the children of, from these unsustainable uh, conditions they are living in, uh, as well as on the long term level, protecting the world and these children from being raised to become the next generation of Salafi jihadists. Um, and after a full year with no other rep uh, repatriations, we made the decision to step up in our advocacy work and uh, founded the NGO called Repatriate the Children, simple as that. We're launching it this week and um, we, uh, we are a nationally based organization with both a national and international perspective of collaboration. Uh, we encourage engaged individuals in other countries to start their own repatriation, uh, repatri repat repatriate the children organizations at, uh, or networks or campaigns uh, to create a global network of associations uh, that works towards a common goal. Uh, already yesterday, um, there is an initi initiative um, launch, uh, Repatriate the Children US, and we are Repatriate the Children Sweden. So. Uh, um, for anyone who is interested in being part of this concept, uh, I would uh, kindly ask you to get in contact with me so we can share our statues and our action plan and our logo with the name of the nation that you're representing. Um, so what we do really is that we want to raise awareness on the issue of uh, the children in Northeast Syria in order to contribute to um, knowledge-based decision-making where humanitarian principles, rule of law and security are united. Uh, we also uh, would gladly like to share our experiences and contribute with expertise, information and knowledge on, on the matter to decision makers, authorities, institutions and NGOs. Uh, we also want to support relatives in Sweden of children in Northeast Syria. This is something that Patricio Galvez has been working a lot with the past year. Uh, relatives from all over the world uh, contacting him, like how did you do, how did you manage, what tools did you use to get your grandchildren back? Um, but I also want to be clear with what we cannot do. Uh, as an NGO um, working on a volunteer basis, we cannot take any responsibility for repatriation, financing of repatriation trips or visiting trips for relatives. Uh, we cannot even guarantee that we would be able to help on site. We do not distribute financial contributions. And what is very important is that the children are our, fo uh, our focus. We do not... Um, interfere in their parents or other adults cases. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. Uh, that was great. And uh, I think I would add to the story that Patricio, as far as I understand, was separated from his children. The seven children were put in various homes and not so close to him. And there was some frustration with that. But um, great story and great initiative. Uh, we promised Emmanuel that he could ask the first question. After him, we have our um, representative from Northeast Syria in Washington, D.C., Sanam Mohammed, who would like to make a comment as uh, representing the Autonomous Administration. But Emmanuel, we promised you, so you can go first. Uh, good morning. No, no. Oh. no, I think we promised Emmanuel first, so let's let Emmanuel speak and then Sanam. Okay? Thanks. Zach, I need you to unmute Emmanuel. Is it working? Yeah, okay, it's working. Is it working now? 
Okay. Yeah. I'm Emmanuel Didier. I'm a, I'm a lawyer by uh, training. I'm also, um, I also was a ref, refugee judge and I was the first secretary of the International Court of Justice. So I come with a certain background, but also a certain experience because I heard lots of uh, refugee claimants coming from the region just at the end of uh, Saddam's regime. So Alan Fall and what preceded and what followed is very uh, well known to me. Now, with regard to the children, I think it's extremely important to distinguish cases. In particular, there are two different types of cases which have to be completely separated. One, the children who were brought, who were born in a foreign country, uh, for example, uh, Sweden, France, elsewhere, and those who were born in Iraq, that's extremely important because the situations are extremely different legally. The child has a right to be treated as a citizen of the country in which he or she was born, which imposes obligations to the country in question, whether they like it or not, but it, it gives a very strong legal basis. Whereas in the case of the children who were born in Iraq, it's a very different situation, which will vary enormously according to the uh, situation of the mother. For example, the uh, Yazidi mothers who have been systematically raped for the purpose of creating children who, according to Iraqi law, would be treated as uh, of the same religion as their father. So one of the problems with the Yazidi children is that on the one hand, yes, you have the theology, the Yazidi theology, concerning the belonging to that group, but you also have the legal aspect, which is that the law in Iraq says that a child has automatically the religion of his father. So you have to be very clear in distinguishing the cases because the solutions are very different uh, in, in each case. Um, Another case, for example, is the uh, participation of the mother to ISIS. Was the mother, how would I say, innocent about what, what was happening? Or was the mother participant to the, um, to the spe specific group of women in charge of applying the Sharia in ISIS, uh, in ISIS uh, regions? Which means that in that case, that woman is extremely dangerous and she will remain dangerous now and in the future for the children, where, wherever the children may be. So we have to start characterizing the issues more specifically because in some cases, the solutions will be much easier than others. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Emmanuel. And I think that could start off a whole discussion, but I do want uh, Sanam Mohammed to speak. So Zach, if you could unmute our colleague and uh, this is a good friend and someone I very much respect. So happy to have you here, Sanam. Sanam, you're on, if you want to speak. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for organizing this very important panel. And uh, I would say also uh, hi to uh, Ambassador Peter. Hope you are doing well. And everyone here uh, whom I'm seeing on the uh, screen. And for Anne also, she's really doing a very uh, amazing work and very dangerous work. I know about it. Thank you so much. Um, um, we are talking now about a very important issue. It is not the issue of the children only. It is related to gather. It is the issue of ISIS members who committed the crimes in the region. It is the issue of the women who committed the crimes to the Yazidi women in Sanjar and, and even in Syria, in Iraq, in Syria, in Raqqa, and whatever is it. So, uh, so this issue, it is really important issue. When we related all these issues together, and the children are the victims here, we know that. We we ask it in the beginning of after the I mean uh, Al Baghos and after uh, uh, I mean uh, having this camp of uh, Al Holkar, we ask every countries European countries to get their. ISIS members or these women back to their countries, but nobody respond to us. Neither the United, I mean, in the, the European countries, neither the others also, I mean, the Arab countries. So they say they are dangerous for us to keep them back. And it happened when 
recently, I think in Finland, a woman, she ran away with her children. She went to Finland and there was a very big issue on the media of Finland. The people, they were very worried about these uh, dangerous people. They come back to their country. So this is the issue. How can we keep these dangerous people in our country, in our place, which is a place of conflict till now? Just yesterday, Turkey, they uh, shall be some places. So uh, in this uh, situation in, 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 in Syria, we are having them in a very uh, I mean, difficult and dangerous situation, either in the camp or in the presence in the detainee centers. And maybe you witness in the detainee centers when they, they try to, I mean, uh, rise, you know, have a, a riots in the, in, the, in the presence and they could control it, the SDF could control it with the help of the uh, coalition actually. So all this issue is going on. The presence there is not qualified for a, such dangerous ISIS members. So it is, this is one issue. The camp of Hall, which holds about maybe 60,000 uh, families with the women, with the children there, it is always having many problems. Uh, many incidents happening with the committed the crimes. These women who are in the camps, they are so dangerous till now. They are really, uh, uh, I mean, committed the crime. They killed many people in the camps, wherever they saw that they are not with the same ideology. You know. These women in the camps, they are raising, they are, I mean, uh, the children there are growing to the very extremist ideology from now. So a child of six years, seven years, or eight years old, after 10 years, after five years, you will have a new generation of ISIS coming out of this camp if we couldn't make any uh, step now to stop these things. So we ask it either to have uh, these children, I mean, we, we ask it for the orphans to go back. I mean, if any countries want to get them back, but some of them, they get them. But about the, the, the children who are with their mother, we, we have some cases, the mother doesn't want to separate from her children. She will say either I will go with my mother, I mean with the children, or I will not. So this is an issue. And the mother, the, the country will not ask, I mean, uh, I mean uh, accepted them. This is another issue. Another issue we have, some mothers, uh, they, I mean, some of them, they have four children, you know, we have these cases, each children from different nationality. So if you have four children, they have four countries. So imagine this. Some countries doesn't want to get them. Some countries they say yes, but the mother, she doesn't want to do that. So this is a problem. So I think if in order to solve such a problem, all the global coalition countries, they are responsible for it. Not only the administration of Northeast Syria. We are not the only one responsible. We, we didn't bring them to our country, you know. We actually, we defeat them and we could protect all the world from this terrorist group. This is one issue. We ask it, okay, if you are not going to take them there, let us have the, the tribunals or the court for them in, in Syria, in north of Syria. And this court will not be only with the judge, I mean, of Syria. They will be from the, their countries also. Let them come as an observer, as a, uh, you know, advisor, whatever they are, they can, even they can participate in this court. And in the, so we have to bring them to justice in Syria. If their country, they are not willing to get them back. We have to bring them to justice. This is what we need now from the countries. This is another issue. The other one, I mean, now I told that we have in the presence, many cases happen, they are trying to run away and if escape. Even it happened from that whole camp. They, 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 there are many smugglers paying money and escaped, and it happened. You know, it is a big camp with thousands, uh, ten thousands of the people living in the camp. Actually, this camp it is like a, a small town. You know, you can say like that. So really, it is so difficult to control everyone in the camp. So for that, we say, okay, let us build a very qualified presence for these uh, uh, ISIS members, unless you have 
any court or any, I mean, bring them to justice. And for the, the camp, let us have some uh, uh, training courses for the children to be away, I mean, away from the radicalism and extremism from their mothers. So let them build, uh, I mean, a good program for them in the camp. So they have to be in the camp with the uh, training them, educating them to a very uh, different education from their mother. This is another issue. And we tried in the camp, I think recently you heard about, they tried to uh, re, um, I mean, uh, having established or organized the camp in the way that they got all the data, information from each one, and to separate the one who are most dangerous in one, I mean, part from the other, even women. Because some women in the camp, they are Yazidi, but they are not able to say we are Yazidi because they will be killed by the other people, the women there. So this is the issue now. So how can we help the administration in order to uh, solve this issue? We are willing, we are willing, we are open to any, uh, you know, uh, ideas or any help to that, either to help us in rebuilding, to secure the, the presence and to secure the, the even the, uh, I mean, uh, the camp, or to, to again, uh, uh, re-educating these children. It is very, they are the victims. I agree with everybody about the children. Uh, you know, I know some people, they didn't want to take them to their country, even they are orphans. I think before two days, uh, France, they got some of the orphans uh, to, to, I mean, to their country. That would be good because we, this heavy burden on the administration alone, it is so difficult for us. We are not going to hold this responsibility alone. So we have, I mean, asking the other to share us this responsibility, either in building good presence or to re, uh, I mean, establishing this uh, uh, camp or to get these orphans or these children mother to their country. This is what we are, or to make, uh, at least to bring them to justice in the place where they committed the crimes. After that, if they are being to justice to the court, that time their country, they can get them back and we are happy to do that. Uh, I would like to say thank you so much for uh, everyone here. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunam. And uh, you brought up some of these really tricky issues. Um, I hear so many things about the Yazidis. There's some Yazidi women that are hiding because they don't want to, um, they don't want to go home because they have to give up their children. And Peter, I'm really glad you brought that issue up. But if they go back, and as Emmanuel said, their children are uh, classified, um, and Peter said it too, as uh, non-Yazidi, and the government uh, classifies them as Muslim because of their rapist fathers. So some of the women have decided to stay in El Hol uh, because they don't want to give their children up. And we've also talked to uh, therapists in Iraq and Yazidis in Iraq that have told about giving their children up and you know imagine for a mother that you put your child in an orphanage so the Yazidi issues are really horrible and for sure we can say that those women are not guilty and I, I think one of the uh, complications um, with all of this is when we start to bring the children back um, then we open the door for the mothers to come back. And that's what most of these countries don't want and fear. So I see that Tasneem is with us, um, a lawyer from the UK that's worked on Shamima Begum's case, as well as others. And uh, he has a comment he wants to make. And uh, Tasneem, why don't you take the floor for a second? And then Peter, it looks like you want to say something? I want to come back to some of the points that Sina made. Okay. But let's let Tasneem just say his comment, and then we'll come back. I am. Thank you so much. Um, well, one of the issues is that we hear all the time in the UK, we've got exactly the same sort of problems as uh, you've outlined, Beatrice, in terms of the, uh, the, the appetite for bringing even children back is limited. And what we've noticed is that where certain children appear in the tabloid media in a positive way, then the government somehow manage to get themselves organized in order to get those specific children back. So we, we have that case in the UK, Shamima Begum's child died. We were told by 
various ministers that it was too dangerous for anyone to go out there. Fast forward a few months, we have three orphan children from the UK appearing in the tabloids and uh, in a more positive light to say that their parents had died and that it was terrible that these kids were there. Within two weeks, after a bit of a push, the uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Office managed to go out there, get them, and they're repatriated rather uh, positively with their grandparents and they're doing very well. Um, so we seem to have a foreign policy and a domestic policy driven by editors of newspapers more than the elected representatives of our, of our governments. And in that circumstance, it may be that we need to rethink about um, the general strategy towards this cause or the cause of at least those children. Um, and and that, is, that is to try and maybe put um, PR agencies or uh, get editorial or editors together and to say, well, we want to push this cause forward because it's the right and just thing to do. And if there's that sort of reporting around it, then we've seen our governments on an anecdotal basis respond to that positively. Um, we are supposed to care about our citizens as a state. The problem is most of us have politicians who are elected uh, making decisions about state, and they're actually making decisions based upon their own electability and their own popularity rather than decisions of state. So they're refusing to take off their political hats um, whilst they're supposed to be wearing their state hats. Um, and so I guess it means we might need to think about going behind that and to start pushing with the PR side of things, with those of us who care, so that the political hat and the, and, and the righteous hat are one in the same on this issue. But that, that's a job for us. Um, so I thought maybe I'll, I'll put that out there and see what people think about that. Thank you. Thank you, Tasneem. Peter, when uh, you speak, will you also speak a little bit about, um, when we spoke privately, you, you and I were speaking about um, at what point will the Autonomous Administration and the SDF possibly uh, have to or be willing to turn the prisoners over to Assad? Because uh, the SDF is not asking to uh, seed from Syria. It is one country and it still is Assad's country. And uh, that's a horrific thought that, you know, these women for sure would be raped, the men would be raped, and God knows what would happen to the children. And you and I spoke privately about that. I don't know if you're willing to say your comments here, but please, uh, if you would just respond to all the questions, it would be great. Sure. Um, well, obviously the, the future of North <laughs> Korea is, uh, is uncertain. Um, and and uh, one major reason for the uncertainty uh, is the uh, 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 unreliable behavior of the uh, United States, or at least of the uh, uh, president of the United States. Uh, and it's always one call to Erdogan, the Turkish president, and it's something different. And this is exactly what happened last October when uh, Trump gave a green light to the Turkish invasion. Uh, the uh, administration was, was faced with a choice. Uh, the SDF, uh, if they don't have the US as an ally, Turkey's invading and attacking, where might they make a deal? And, and indeed the Russians stepped in, they brokered a deal with the Syrian government. And it, you, one has to remember that the, by and large, the SDF has not fought against the Syrian government, the, the way in which Northeast Syria came into the hands of uh, what eventually became the SDF. Uh, was uh, because the Syrian government withdrew its most of its forces from there. They still have a presence in Kamishli, Kamishlu, um, and, uh, uh, and 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 the uh, Kurdish forces uh, filled the the, the vacuum. Uh, and their fight has been against uh, was against ISIS, not against the Syrian government. So, uh, uh, and and if you think of the future of Syria, it's obvious that Assad has won the civil war. He, uh, until October, until Trump did what he did, two thirds of the country was effectively controlled by the government, some pockets by the opposition, and one third by the, uh, uh, by the, the SDF. Uh, uh, so some arrangement that preserves some of the achievements of, the, of what the SDF has accomplished uh, with the, in terms of uh, gender equality and uh, representation of communities and uh, uh, you know, a, a number of other achievements, but within the framework of the Syrian state is, is the likely solution. And it, as part of that, it, 
it would be likely at some point in time, and I think there's even been a uh, some kind of agreement about this, which, you know, vague agreement anyhow, that responsibility for the prisoners would return to the Syrian government. Um, and I think there are a couple of possibilities to what the Syrian government might will do with them. Uh, one is uh, certainly with the men uh, prisoners, they could meet the fate of uh, other opponents of Assad and, and be killed. Um, or possibly, as was done after the American invasion in 2003 with extremists, they were released. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, it may be that the Syrian government will keep the male fighters as a uh, some kind of card to use against uh, uh, the Western countries and, and perhaps as a bargaining chip uh, to, um, to, to secure lifting of sanctions and uh, uh, more normal relations. Uh, I, I don't know that it follows that all the women would be raped, but they might not, they, they might have a, a bad end and, and, and who knows what's going to happen to the children. Um, and that, it comes to the uh, second point, well, the, well the, which is uh, if the Europeans, because obviously there isn't American leadership here, at least not till uh, noon on the 20th of January next year, um, uh, could in the interim pr provide some stronger security guarantees to the SDF. And if the entire international community uh, uh, might also provide resources. I mean, it is absurd to have spent billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars to fight against ISIS. And then to, uh, just from a security point of view, forget anything humanitarian about the children, but to have a circumstances in which um, you, you, you are going to raise thousands of new fighters uh, for, uh, you know, our, our children's, our grandchildren's generation. Um, uh, you know that 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 just that just didn't make sense, uh, and so uh, and and the help hasn't been there. Sinam has a, a very good point, uh, which is that uh, uh, you know if, if there were adequate financing, then these then, then these camps and incidentally they're not refugee camps. These people are not refugees; they're prisoners, and they're people who went to Syria for the purpose of joining a terrorist organization. Some of the Syrian and Iraqi women may may not be criminals, but all these people did something criminal. So these are prisons uh, and they're not refugees. Uh, the, of course, the children aren't, well, that, that actually gets to the next point. But so you might want to have ways to better secure the prisons. And like any prison system, you divide between the maximum security, the dangerous people and the minimum security. Uh, and and the, the camp administrations actually have a pretty good idea as to who's who. So one idea is to separate out the less radical women, those who, for example, won't be covering themselves and, and uh, you know, I mean, some pretty obvious behavior, uh, and they might keep their children. But with the, with the other ones, you, you, you don't actually keep children in prison. Uh, and if you look at international law and the rights of the child, the governing standard is the best interest of the child. And the best interest of the child, of course, is generally presumed to be with his or her parents. But that's not always the case, where the parents are dangerous, where they're engaged in dangerous behavior or put the children in dangerous situations, governments remove the children. And that's exactly what ought to be happening here. Also, because once you separate the, the mothers from their children, uh, it makes it easier to repatriate a larger number of them. Uh, so, uh, you know, that um, uh, is there. I just want, oh, um, uh, and, and uh, to go to uh, Tasneem's point, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I actually was there when those three orphans uh, came out uh, uh, of, of, um, of, of Syria. The, the British diplomats, uh, they just went across the bridge. Uh, so, you know, this was a question of having them brought there. The, 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 ch uh, the children were just, they were emaciated and they were terrified, rather different from Elsa's children uh, who were very lively uh, and had obviously been well taken care of. Uh, but uh, it, it, it isn't just the orphans. And if this problem, a quick way to do it in my judgment is to separate the children, then who knows what's going to happen? Either they grow up in these circumstances, become radicalized. What happens to them if the Syrian government takes the thing over? Uh, and, a, and a final point um, on this issue of the religion of the of the, of the registration of what what is the religion that goes with the 
uh, children of raped Yazidi women. This is actually a little less clear uh, for a variety of reasons. One is that, um, uh, of course, you, you may not identify the father uh, uh, who, of, who is the, the rapist. Uh, secondly, I, I am told that, in fact, this isn't a requirement to, to list the religion of the father. Um, but third, Kurdistan, Iraqi Kurdistan has, has its own lawmaking ability that is within the Kurdistan region of Iraq superior to Iraqi law in accordance with Articles 115 and 121 of the Iraqi Constitution. So even if that were an Iraqi decision, these women uh, uh, are in the jurisdiction of the Kurdistan regional government. So it is possible to adjust Kurdistan law to make sure that uh, the religion of the father was not on, on their documents. Uh, and that probably is the correct solution. The, the difficulty is, that you can't put the religion on the mother either because the Yazidi community refuses to accept that these children are Yazidis. Thank you, Peter. Um, we have another question that I was asked to voice, and uh, but I just want to mention some things. One that uh, the coalition is supporting uh, with some significant money uh, for uh, building prisons, equipping prisons, uh, training, and that's good, and that's exactly what should be happening. And you're absolutely right to say that these are not refugee camps, they're prisons. The State Department has told me that it's very important to keep Al Hole designated as a camp so that the NGOs can work there because it would change uh, legal statuses uh, for NGOs to work if it changed its status to a prison. But the truth is, it is a prison. People are locked there, and children are locked there. Um, Molly put up on the chat uh, a paper that we just put out. Uh, one woman was just recently repatriated to Sweden and three Finnish women with their children. All four of those women escaped from Al Hol. Uh, some women escape and don't try to get home. So they're taking their children uh, off to uh, more terrorism adventures. That should for sure be stopped. And as Sanam said, uh, you know, it's an overwhelming situation for the autonomous administration. They need our help, they need our money. If we're going to refuse to help take the children and their mothers and their fathers home, uh, then we need to help pay the bill and uh, help these people. I mean, some of these people are making $70 a month. And, uh, you know, we expect them to resist a, a $7,000 bribe to uh, let a woman smuggle with her children out of the camp. That's not very realistic. And, uh, and as you know, the situation in Syria is getting more and more uh, dire with the financial, um, the, I think the Caesar Act, is that what we call it? But Peter, the question that I was asked to voice to you was, um, do you think that Turkey will invade again? Because a lot of uh, what happened uh, in Northeast Syria and some of the really dire situation and the safety of the children has a lot to do, and as you said, the negotiations that were made and the possible turning of the prisoners over to Assad at some point, do you think Turkey will continue its assaults or invade again? And what will the, what will the US government do if that happens? Uh, well, obviously I hope not, uh, but he, here's, and, and it may be that the situation will be saved by COVID-19 and the new wave in the fall, um, but, <laughs> Here's what I, I think is, I, I must say, just read John Bolton's book or read the press accounts if you don't wish to uh, contribute to Bol Bolton's uh, royalty income uh, uh, about what happened. Uh, uh, first, the corrupt relationship between Trump and Turkey. Um, and David Ignatius has a column about that in the Post today. But you know, I think the real danger is going to be what happens uh, after November, uh, whether Trump wins or loses, um, there's nothing to constrain him. And so you have a period of time between, uh, at least I hope it's just between November 3rd and January 20th, uh, where he, you know, this, this is somebody who's completely unconst unconstrained, um, who is uh, in a, some kind of relationship with Erdogan. Uh, and again, I, I don't want to sound like some you know uh, uh, what it was called? He called Trump phobia. That this is, you know, this is from his own national security advisor, um, and and it is what happened in in uh, October of 2019. Uh, so I th I think that is that that is just the the 
the great danger uh, uh, for the situation is that after, I don't, I think it's not so likely to take place after, before the election because there was a lot of, you know, the one foreign policy issue that Trump got a lot of criticism from, from Republicans was uh, his betrayal of the Kurds. Uh, but what happens uh, between November 3rd and January 20th, that, that actually worries me a lot for Northeast Syria. Of course, I worry about it for a lot of other places, you know, for the U.S. as well. We, thank you, Peter. We have one more question by uh, Peta Lowe. And I think, Peta, I won't, uh, uh, I'll just voice it for you since we're getting short of time. Uh, she's asking, are there um, any assessments that are going on for the women and children? And I would say, as far as I know, no. I've offered, um, I've made hun uh, over 100 interviews in SDF territory, 240 total. And I've offered to all the European countries and any country where the, the women, men, children want to be repatriated that I'll give my preliminary assessment. I'm a psychologist. And I can say after talking for an hour and a half with a woman, this one doesn't look uh, that uh, devoted to ISIS anymore. And I wouldn't judge it. I, I know what you're saying, Peter, about whether they're fully covered or not anymore. But you know, even if they're fully covered, that doesn't necessarily mean that they still endorse the ISIS ideology. And there's plenty of them. I mean, I can tell you a case of a Belgian woman that uh, her father was shot in front of her eyes. She hates ISIS. Do you think she's ever gonna go back to a group that um, killed her own father right in front of her? She was shot while holding her baby by ISIS. Um, she was put in ISIS prison. And there's plenty of cases like that. So I can say from an hour and a half uh, interview, this woman does not appear to me to still be um, committed to ISIS. But as far as formal uh, Pata, I don't think they're going on. Maybe someone else knows something. Well, it, it just at the moment in, in uh, Hull, the, the uh, SDF is, is uh, going through a, a, a process of uh, trying to register and, and identify people and doing biometric data. Um, and there that's, are different that's rules. That's psychological. And, and there are also... But, but Andrew, just just yeah. a second. There, there are different rules in uh, Roj and Al Hull. So in Roj, women are not allowed to cover their faces. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, in Al Hull, they, I mean, the, the, it, the camp administration really doesn't control the camp, particularly not the foreign annex. Um, so, but but I, I do think you know I I do I, I, I do think that that I, I, accepting your point, but I think that is one indication of uh, you know wh where somebody's views are, um, and 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 it's very hard to make you know to have uh, uh, any kind of good system, but it but it is important I think to try to separate the radical women who you would put into basically prisons from the less radical women who go, if you will, to a minimum security prison and of course continue to have their children, all this with the goal at least of trying to lead to the repatriation of the children. We, thank you. We have uh, one other comment um, from Germany or about Germany saying that uh, some of these women have spent so long in the camps and they will get pretty short prison sentences if they do get home and if they are successfully prosecuted. And in the case you gave Peter where this woman could be prosecuted but probably won't be because uh, the Germans will see no uh, point in it because she's doing so well with her child. Um, but it, it has been said to me by uh, German prosecutors that probably when people are brought home from Iraq or Syria, that the courts will accept their time that they spent in other prisons, although Camp Hall is not technically a prison, uh, according to legal definitions right now. Um, so if they get home and they're successfully prosecuted, put in prison, will they spend six months there? and uh, then continue on. And there are dangerous women. We do have to admit there are extremely dangerous women. But then there's also a lot of women that, you know, I really think we should feel pretty. Hello, Mrs. Yeah. Uh, is that, this that, uh, Anne, that, yeah. that's exactly the, the problem that, that European um, countries have. Um, which is why, and, and I think one has to be understanding of this, why they in fact do not wish to take people back. 
uh, because they, they cannot know whether the adults are dangerous or not. Um, and, uh, and, and, they, and, they, and, and because of the very democratic systems that they have, including you know, the um, justice system they have, it's impossible to confine people uh, in, in many cases, uh, absent some higher crime, like uh, having had a slave uh, for a very long period of time. Uh, and how, how do you operate? You, you bring back these people uh, and then somebody, one of them drives a van into a, a, a Christmas market in Berlin. Uh, you know, I mean, how do you balance the, the risk you have to innocent human beings from people who themselves chose to go there? Um, and that's why at best the repatriation of the individuals is going to have to be on a case-by-case -case basis. But the children, and, and, and it will take a long time, and, and, uh, you know, the, and I think it's also important to know, uh, again, coming back to, I think, what Tasneem said, you know, you get publicity about three kids. If, if your rate of repatriation is uh, the rate it has been now, I don't know, 20 or 30 kids a year, we're going to be stretching into the, you know, well into the next uh, century before it, the process is completed. I mean, th th this, this can work for a few individual cases where you can get press, but but that is not a solution to the broader problem. But, uh, hello, Mr. Peter. No, no, I'm sorry. It's 1230. We have to stop. So I want to thank uh, Beatrice. Thank you for your um, initiative for starting Repatriate the Children. Thank you, Ambassador Galbraith, for your um, long years of knowledge and uh, the breadth of uh, knowledge and experience you bring to this topic. You're a hero. I hope you keep working on this. Beatrice, you're a hero too. And uh, I've tried to read the chat during this. We will go through the chat, try to answer as many questions as we can, and we'll be posting this video. I'm sorry we have to cut it off, but we try to stay on time. And uh, thank you to everyone. And if you want to continue with us in two weeks, we will have uh, two very Dutch, uh, very skilled Dutch people from the prisons talking about this issue of what do you do with them now that you have them home. But when it comes to the children, please do whatever you can to help them. And thank you so much to our speakers and to our, uh, our participants. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for um, your questions and answers.